Welcome to the weekly podcast of Bright Star Bible Church. Thank you for joining us. As you listen to the proclamation of God's Word, our prayer for you is the same prayer Jesus prayed for His church in John 17, 17. Lord, sanctify them in truth. Your Word is truth. If you would, uh, go ahead and stand to your feet. And we're going to read in Mark chapter 1. We're doing verses 29 through 39 this morning. Mark 1, verses 29 through 39. This is the Word of God. And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And she came... And he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she began waiting on them. Now, when evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city had gathered at the door, and he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was." And in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus rose up and went out of the house and went away to a desolate place and was praying there. And Simon and his companions searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go elsewhere to the towns nearby, so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came out for. And he went preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out the demons. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love, for your mercy, and for your grace, Lord. And we are so thankful for your word, this light in the darkness, Lord, this this, uh, lamp unto our feet. We pray, Lord, that we would uh, have the courage today to take the truth of your word and submit to it, Lord, that our our, our minds might be renewed and our lives might be changed Lord, that we'd be, we would be transformed into your image. In Christ's name I pray, amen. All right, so as always, I want to do a, a quick review just to kind of cover what we covered last week as we begin. Uh, and I want to focus on the context of the passage in order to understand why Mark is actually writing about these things. What is Mark trying to establish in the mind of the reader? And it's simply that Jesus is God. From the very beginning of the gospel account, he says as much. In verse 1, Mark 1, 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Mark begins right away identifying Jesus in order to establish that he operates in the authority of God. He is the long-awaited Messiah, the prophet of all prophets, the king of kings. He is the creator, the source of all things created, both visible and invisible. He's the source of all power, both visible and invisible. And therefore, in his earthly ministry, Jesus conducted himself in such a way that displayed his eternal attributes as God. So Mark, in quick succession, is marking, uh, marching through the evidence as Christ is proving without a doubt his sovereign cosmic authority in various different ways. First, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the words of the prophets in his coming. The Holy Spirit and the Father affirmed him at his baptism. Jesus defeated Satan in the wilderness Jesus exercised authority over sin in his effectual preaching of the gospel. He displayed his power over the sinner and the sinner's will in commanding his disciples to come follow, and they dropped everything and they just followed him. Uh, He displayed his uh, manifested power over the demons, and we read about that last week, and, and also showed his eternal authority in how he spoke or preached the truth. And this was because he was God in the flesh. And if he was God in the flesh, then he would have no problem at all accomplishing his Father's will. Correct? If he's God, it's just logical that he could do what he wants to do and he would have no problem accomplishing his Father's will. And he would succeed even in the face or in spite of those who opposed him. 
Nothing could slow Jesus down or stop him. There was not one formidable foe that could throw a wrench in his plans. Those who sought to oppose him, both spiritual beings and physical beings, did so on authority that was ultimately given to them by Christ himself. This was not a mono imano battle between Jesus and the dark forces. He told the demons to be silent, and they obeyed. There, was no, there were no battles going on there. Okay? They were terrified of him. He was, in fact, their creator, and they knew it. And they fell down at his feet, and they cried out for mercy because they knew exactly who he was. They knew their future. They knew that they had an appointed day of judgment ahead. So Mark is step by step proving the sovereign authority as Jesus being God in man's flesh. And what else must he prove? Well, if he's God in man's flesh, he would have to prove that he has the power and authority to reverse the curse of sin. And specifically, we know that from the time sin entered the world, mankind has dealt with all kinds of chaos and calamity. This is not the way the Lord originally created the world. Fallen creation has offered the likes of wildfires and tornadoes, tsunamis and hurricanes, volcanoes, floods, earthquakes, droughts, all the things that we see on a, on a cyclical basis in this earth. Those sorts of calamitous dangers surround mankind every day, and it's not uncommon for us to see a major disaster take place and millions of people uh, being killed in the process. And that has happened over and over again throughout the history of mankind. And you and I, each of us, have an appointment as well. The Bible says that there is a date set on a calendar that cannot be changed. It's been ordained by God Himself, and that is the day that we die. That's the day that we will stand before Him in judgment. But leading up to that, there's one constant thing that happens all around us, and that is decay. Decay is happening all around us. All things are in a state of decay. In Psalm 102, 25, and 26, it says the earth and the heavens will wear out like a garment. So you could toss aside all these theories about global warming, guys. The, the earth is not an eternal thing. The earth ages just like you and I age. It just takes much longer for the earth to age. And from the time of the fall and from the time of this catastrophic flood, the earth has been aging. The earth has been decaying. The earth has been falling apart, and it needs its creator to come back and fix it again. It's wearing out like a garment. The earth and all creation itself groans, as Paul writes in Romans 8, 22, waiting for the redemption that will only come from Jesus Christ himself. What else is decaying? Well, he mentions in Romans 8, 23, your body is decaying. I can say a hearty amen to that. It is physically dying. Because of fallen creation, we deal with decay in various ways in our biology, okay? So day by day, year by year, you look at the pictures of yourself, you walk around with a little less hair, a few more wrinkles. Uh, decay guides us, uh, a constant companion on our way to death. I know I'm, I'm super positive this morning, right? Um, Oh, let me just add, there's no escape either. There's no escape. We're all going to die. And I found it very interesting that before the 1800s, there was no actual bona fide cure for any kind of disease. Like, uh, cures are relatively new in human history. They had homeopathic-type remedies. They had different things that they did to try to help people through their sickness, their illness. Uh, but disease was brutal, to mankind. It was no respecter of age or race. In fact, the plague of Justinian arrived around 541 AD and it spread like wildfire across Europe and Asia, North Africa and Arabia, and it killed 30 to 50 million people. And at the time, that was about half of the world's population. And then the Black Death, which hit Europe in 1347, it claimed 25 million lives in just four years. And then smallpox in the 15th century in the Americas killed 93% of the native population. And Mexico went from 11 million people 
uh, before the conquest to only one million people after the conquest. In the majority of human history, if you became ill with an infection or some sort of disease, a high fever, there was a really good chance that that was the way you were going to go out, okay? So considering how devastating the curse of sin is on creation and on the human body, what then in Scripture should we expect of Jesus if he is God? Well, if he is indeed God in the flesh, then he should be able to prove it by exercising his authority as the creator and as the great physician. He should have power over the earth and all that is in it, including calamitous weather and sickness and disease, deformity, blindness, and even death. Look at verse 29. And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now those four knew each other. They were fishing buddies. That was their trade. And it was a pretty good trade, okay? They, they weren't just out there with a little uh, Zebco fishing pole and, and a hook with a worm on it. These guys, this is what they did for a living, and they did it well, and they worked together, these four men. This account takes place immediately after they left the synagogue where Jesus had just cast out the demon, what we studied last week. And it's interesting that directly across from the exit of the synagogue, you'll find the house of Peter there in Capernaum. Uh, and because of archaeological discoveries, we have every reason to believe that this is the actual house of the apostle Peter. Uh, the blue color well, let's just, as you, as you look at these, so you can see the synagogue over there on the left. Now, this is what you're looking at inside here, uh, which is Peter's house, and it had been converted over the years into a church. So once, once, of course, Peter was gone, then a church took over and began to worship there at his house. You can go ahead and go to the next one, and uh, you can sort of see how, sh how close it is. This is Peter's house to the right, and that's the, the structure they built actually over the top of the ruins, and it's got a glass floor, so you can go up in there and look down into the ruins and not cause any decay or um, anything like that. So, okay, go to the next one there. All right, so here you see these various floor plans, and, and um, anyway, the green is the layout in the 4th century when believers met there for worship. The blue color shows the original floor plan, and the orange is a 5th century floor plan uh, for the same purpose of worship. So they just kept building on and adding to it. And again, less than a, a stone's throw away from the synagogue, they walked to Peter's house uh, with Andrew, James, and John. And it's believed that Peter, his wife, possibly some of their children... And uh, her mother and his brother Andrew were all living in this place at the same time. So Peter took care of all of these folks. And uh, in verse 30 then, look at verse 30. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And having just witnessed the authority that Jesus showed over in the synagogue in commanding the demon to come out of the man... Uh, they then wanted to talk to Jesus about healing Peter's mother-in-law. I don't think you have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out what they were talking to him about uh, because it states it in, the, in verse 31 here. He came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she began waiting on them. She just popped right up and started serving them, started hosting, started in with her hospitality, okay? In Luke's account in chapter 4, Luke 4, 38 and 39, he gives us a little further detail. He says Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, no doubt some sort of life-threatening infection, and they asked him to help her, and standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her. Now just consider what this is saying. Jesus went to her, he stood over her, he took her by the hand, and he rebuked the fever. And whatever was happening in her body to cause that fever, whatever the infection was, uh, whatever was present, the creator of all things, both visible and invisible, he knew that it was present, okay? He simply told it to go away, and it went away. And this was no more difficult for Jesus than telling the demon to leave the man's body in the synagogue. He was able to do these things because Jesus was God on earth in the flesh, just a fair warning this morning, I'm going to say some things that might make some of you angry, all right? 
I can't do anything about that. I, I don't sit around and try to figure out ways to finagle around making folks angry. I'm just going to preach the Word of God, and I'm going to tell you what I believe with all of my heart the Word of God is telling us. Um, I'm not trying to be controversial, not trying to be divisive, and I am going to challenge you to not get so angry that you might get up and walk out this morning, okay? I would challenge you to sit around and wait till the end. Now that's got you on the edge of your seats. You're wondering what in the world am I going to say? But I want to make it very clear first and foremost that I do believe that God has done and can do miracles. He still does so according to his divine perfect will, okay? We read scripture and come to the conclusion, though, that miraculous things, because you're reading scripture, you think that these miraculous things happened every day and all the time, and that is just simply not the case. Some television personalities imply that God has always been a healer and that he wants everybody, anybody that he loves, out of his compassion, he always wants them healed and it's always been that way. And if after all, if God is unchanging, if he's loving, if he's always compassionate and has always been compassionate, surely he was healing his people throughout the whole of human history. But did you know there was not one healing mentioned in Scripture until Genesis 20? And by that time, the time of Abraham, that was around 2200 B.C., you have over 2,000 years of human history that had passed and not one single healing. Surely God loved and had compassion on many of those who were faithful to him during that time. And yet, there were no healings. The 1,500 years between Abraham and Isaiah, there were maybe 15 to 20 miracles in total in that regard. And from, time, uh, from the time of Isaiah to Jesus, which was about a 750-year span, there were none. There were no recorded miracles at all. There was complete silence in the department of the miraculous. And then, of course, we know that Jesus came on the scene. And there was an explosion of signs and miracles and wonders his miraculous works were, as we learned last week, were shocking. It blew their minds. They were in awe, and the word actually means they were almost terrified. It, it, it was like getting smacked in the head with a baseball bat. That's how moving, that's how impactful it was in their minds and hearts. In Matthew 9, 33 one of Jesus' miracles, the crowd said, nothing like this has ever been done in Israel. Now, church, we have to be careful not to speculate and fill in blanks about things that the Bible is not explicit about. Because if we do, we wind up leading others into error. I, wanna, I want you to ask this question this morning, and this is a hard question to ask yourself, because we get comfortable with what we believe. But do we believe what we believe because we take church culture's word for it, or we took our mom and dad's word for it, or we took our family's word for it, or we took even our church, even our church culture. Do we believe what we believe because we want it to be that way? We want God to embody these certain things, and so therefore we lean into this truth believing certain things because that's the way we want God to be, not necessarily what Scripture states. Again, if we want to derive what we believe, we have to do so from Scripture alone, and we find that Jesus was able to do miracles because he was God on earth in the flesh. That's why he did miracles. And I know what I'm going to say next does not align with what many teach in modern times, especially in this area, but I think it's important to say you are not God on earth in the flesh. You are not God on earth in the flesh. Not only that, and let me be clear, you cannot do all of the things that Jesus did. You cannot do all the things that Jesus did. And I know there are many false teachers out there today pushing that lie. It's just not biblical at all. And if taken far enough, and they so often do take it way too far, their teachings call into question Christ's actual deity, that he was God. All right? And also, it very often deifies man. It puts men on God's level. And in, while we're on the subject, it often deifies the devil. It makes him way more powerful than he actually is. And that's three things. When you're looking at something that's 
potentially heretical, does it deify man? Does it humanize God? Does it deify the devil? Those are major red flags when you're hearing speakers talk. Both of those things, deifying man, deifying uh, or, or, or taking away Christ's deity, those are heretical teachings, and they have been throughout church history. So there's heretical theology, which is theology that's completely wrong, and if you actually buy into it and believe it and promote it, it means that you are outside of the faith, that you're not a true Christian believer, Christ follower. And anyone who embraces those things, God's word instructs us to put them out of the church fellowship. Believe it or not, there is such a thing called church discipline. And, and if you're in some sort of sin repeatedly and the church has gone to you, according to Matthew 18, and you have not repented, then our instruction, Christ's first command of the church is, you put that person out of love, you put that person outside the church. Same thing with false teaching. You have someone in the church that keeps promoting a false theology, a false doctrine, you put them outside the church. But I learned a new term this week. Um, maybe I should have known it by now, but hey, we're all still learning, right? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not 50 yet. I'm still a young punk, so I can still learn things. This term that we call aberrant theology. Someone says something that is so off kilter with what we know to be biblical truth about God, it conflicts with the truth. Considering both heretical and aberrant theology, the only way to recognize a counterfeit is to be so in tune with the truth of God's word that when you hear something being spoken that is heretical or someone teaching something that is aberrant, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. And it all starts with how you interpret the Bible. We don't just get to open the book and, and decide what it means. A verse doesn't mean 15 different things to, to 15 different people. It means what it means. And so getting it right is very, very important. Getting it wrong, listen, getting it wrong means you're actually representing God Almighty. It means you're telling people he's someone that he is not. That is bearing false witness against God. Getting it wrong means we misrepresent Jesus. And getting it wrong means we so often misrepresent the purpose of Christ's miracles. With that said, priority number one is understanding that God's word reveals who Jesus really is, and it's not only in the four Gospels. There's this, there's this movement out there today that says if you want to know the real Jesus, perfect theology is found in the four Gospels. I'm sorry, that's wrong. It's wrong. The Old Testament books... Reveal the anticipation of Jesus. Countless types and shadows and prophecies declare Christ's long-awaited coming to redeem mankind. The Gospels reveal the incarnation of Jesus. The whole purpose was his redemptive work. His ministry proved who he is. He's God in the flesh. The book of Acts reveals the proclamation of Jesus. His redemptive work having been completed, he ascended and then he sent the Holy Spirit to empower his, his apostles with delegated miracle power in order to validate the message they were writing, also to empower his church to preach the gospel through all the earth. That is what he commissioned us to do, preach the gospel. Now the epistles, the letters, that's what that word means, the letters, reveal the explanation of Jesus. The word of God was once for all delivered to his church the support and pillar of the truth. Do you understand what that means? The church, the body of Christ, is supposed to hold to the truth no matter what because in this world, the church is the support and pillar of the truth. The church holds up the truth in this world. That's it. The New Testament letters instruct the church how to live, how we are to walk in power, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in our sanctification, in our bearing the fruits of the Spirit. And also, it instructs us, the body of Christ, how to worship Him properly. We don't just come into church and do whatever we want to do. We don't have pyrotechnics and dance around in, in skinny jeans, okay? Uh, that, that's not in Scripture, and we need to be very careful as to how we, decide, how we choose to worship the Lord. Remember um, Nadab and Abihu in the Old Testament. All they did was brought fire into the the tabernacle from a different source than what God had instructed, and he struck them dead immediately. 
we need not think that God is a different God. He still, just because we're under uh, grace now, doesn't mean we shouldn't honor the Lord in the way we worship. So here at Bright Star, we're very careful. That's why we face the other way when we worship. That's why we do different things. We read God's Word and we stand. We try to do everything we can in Scripture according to what Scripture says. Finally, the revelation reveals the glorification of Jesus. His glorious return to destroy sin and death to righteously uh, judge the living and the dead, to rule and reign, and ultimately to make all things new in a new eternal reality. Concerning our passage today, my point is this. When we read the Gospels, we're reading a narrative account of Christ's first coming and His redemptive work. You're reading a narration. It's telling the story. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. It describes what Jesus did as God in order to accomplish his Father's will. And prescriptive describes uh, biblical commands, imperatives given that should be observed by all believers. And of course, there are some of those in the Gospels, but Jesus never prescribed or commanded you and I to do the same kinds of miracles that he did. All right? He did delegate that power to his personal disciples and apostles, but to twist the commands that Jesus gave the 70 when he sent them out, if you're going to take that, literally, folks, if you're going to take that as him telling you to do that, then it means you can't take sandals with you, you can't carry a money belt, you can't go to any Gentiles, you can only go to Israelites. Good luck with that, okay? So we're talking about a proper hermeneutic, interpreting Scripture properly. Okay? And to twist the context of the commands Jesus gave the twelve when he sent them out and apply those commands to believers throughout all of history, that is gross error in properly handling God's word. So just think about it for a moment. Today, right now, you really think that we're supposed to do all of the things that Jesus did? That's your theology, and, and, and I giggle, but that's a lot of folks' theology that we're supposed to be doing all the things that Jesus did. And considering all the things that Jesus did, you go down just just a, a little list here. Jesus walked on water. Jesus rebuked a deadly storm. Jesus pulled a coin from a fish's mouth to pay his taxes. Jesus even raised the dead. And he did so to teach that every true... And, and here's the thing. He did so to prove that he was God. And for someone to teach that every true believer is supposed to be doing all of those things Jesus did and they say even greater miracles than Jesus did, that places an impossible burden on the shoulders of you and I. It places an impossible burden, this, this idea that we're supposed to be someone that we simply cannot be. Why? Why can we not? <laughs> because you and I are not God on earth in the flesh. We're just not. And I want to make it simple. If you flip over to Mark 2 real quick, you probably just have to turn the page there. And I'm going to paraphrase this. Mark 2, verse 5, Jesus said this, Child, your sins are forgiven. The scribes asked, Who can forgive sins but God alone? And I would say to that, Exactly! That right there, your question states what is painfully obvious. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Yes, that's right. The answer is yes. He's God. That's right. Verse 10, Jesus says, So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your mat, and go to your home. You can pray and humbly ask God to protect you and to provide for you. And then what we're called to do is align ourselves with God's will and trust Him with the outcome. The circumstances don't matter. We have eternal promises. We pray, we ask God to deliver us, we ask for his protection, and then we trust God in the midst of all circumstances. Thy will be done. Even Jesus prayed that. But you cannot successfully rebuke a deadly hurricane. You cannot pull a wad of cash out of a, a largemouth bass to go pay your taxes. Okay? You cannot raise the dead, and my friends, you cannot forgive someone's sin. You cannot have the power and authority to change the eternal destination of a sinner who is headed for the lake of fire 
to the throne room of God. The only power you have in that is sharing the gospel. In the ministry of reconciliation, you share the gospel with them, you point to Christ, and if, they, if the Spirit acts on their behalf, then they are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. But you yourself can't forgive their sins. Jesus did all those things because he was acting in the authority as God. The ministry of the apostles and the church uh, was greater in one sense, that we can do greater miracles in one sense. So listen very carefully. Jesus ministered for three and a half years in a tiny little sliver of land, and 95% of his ministry was right around the Sea of Galilee, just right around that little area. His apostles and his church have spread the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and currently we are still carrying the gospel to the remotest parts of the earth. So you see, we're doing greater things in the spread of the gospel and in the period of time that we have spread the gospel. Those are the greater things. It's not, I mean, how can you do a greater work than Jesus raising a man from the dead who's been dead for four days already and he already stinks? Like the Bible makes it a point to say he's already stink, he stinketh. That's what the King James Version say, says, he stinketh. How can you do something greater than that? What, uh, that kind of bad theology causes absolutely tragic circumstances to be even more tragic. And in many unbelieving minds, it calls into question the v validity of the gospel and who God truly is. Now I want to talk about this particular thing that happened back in 2019 or 2020. A modern movement very publicly takes authority over death as they believed their theology told them they could and declared this little girl Olive be raised from the dead. Hashtag wake up Olive. The movement goes viral. National news uh, outlets pick it up and the story spreads around the globe. If there ever was a time that God would hear the prayers and declarations of potentially billions of people, billions of professing believers around the world, if there was ever a time when raising a little girl from the dead would get the attention of the entire world and a miraculous work would spark a worldwide revival, this was it. This would have been the time for God to do that. If their theology is true, why then was baby Olive not raised. And you have to legitimately ask yourself, why did God not answer those millions, possibly billions of prayers? It leads to ridiculous questions being asked, like maybe they didn't have enough faith, all those millions and billions of people. Or maybe the devil was just too strong and God couldn't overcome it in that circumstance. Well, of course not. Of course not. Before you question God, before you question Him, question your own heart. And quite frankly, question your bad theology. Question your interpretation method, because that is the problem. When you promote that because God is good, and because it's always His will to heal, and that He will do what you presumptuously and quite frankly, pompously command Him to do, he will heal, he will raise the dead because you claim it as if you have the authority, the same as the creator of all things, that you have the same power in your words as the word made flesh. You presume to have the same authority as the author of life or the one who says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then tragically, your declaration about God fails miserably and everyone in, in, around the world sees this. What you have successfully done is this. You have egregiously twisted and perverted the very word of God, bearing false witness against him. You've called into question the goodness of God. You've called into question the faithfulness of God. You've called into question the righteousness of God. You've grossly mis misrepresented him to a mass audience, and you have tarnished the true saving gospel of Jesus Christ in the minds of millions, potentially billions of people. And the results of this sort of bad theology and these types of failed mystic shenanigans, and that's what it is. You need to know the difference between what it means to be a Christ follower and be a truly spirit-filled believer, and what it means to be mystic, to be, to be into mysticism, 
completely different things. And folks, Christianity today, modern Christianity today has married itself to mysticism. And you need to be aware of that. It's so tragic. It's so unnecessary. The church, again, is supposed to be the support and pillar of the truth, proclaiming God's word. And so many professing to be his church have so maligned and twisted and perverted the gospel from the promise of eternal salvation. Eternal salvation is what it's all about. And they've swapped it for a desire for temporal comforts, to name it and claim it, to have this desire for supernatural proof that never quite materializes. It's like looking for Bigfoot or aliens. It's just not quite there. It has the opposite effect on people, and it actually repels people from the truth of the gospel. And before you say that the obvious outcome of of healings, that sort of healing would be eternal salvation, I just want to remind you that Jesus healed 10 lepers, and only one leper came back. Only one out of 10 came back and fell at Jesus' feet. So don't automatically assume And look at what Jesus said about uh, some of the cities that he visited frequently and performed mighty miracles, and yet they did not believe. And And also what Brandon, the passage you read this morning, that you don't believe, even when I do the miracles, you don't believe because you're not one of my sheep. Let me also point out that all of these YouTube prophets, the televangelists making millions, making millions off the desperation of those who are sick and diseased, It's pathetic. It's the lowest of low that you can possibly be in the kingdom of God. To take advantage of people who are sick and who are desperate. Now, I want to share, I don't normally talk about myself, and I'm not talking about myself. I'm going to give you a testimony about a period of time in my life. I've closely watched many of these ministries for over 30 years. Back in 2003, I worked for a company in Colorado Springs, and this particular job gave me front row, front row seats to the birth of the NAR, or what's known as the New Apostolic Reformation. I ran a camera at their conferences, and I traveled all over the United States of America with, these, with the big dogs who are in this movement today. And I filmed them all over the, the country in their conferences. I heard them prophesy. I watched them make bold proclamations and declare a reality about God and how he works in the world and his healing and his mighty miracles, all while just raking in the offerings, all while driving extremely expensive cars, buying jets, private jets, all of those things. Of course, we know know that, look, wealth is not a bad thing. It's just like anything else. It's how you use it. But these folks are taking advantage of desperate people and using that to live a life of luxury. I watched as many of them fell into gross sin, disqualifying sin. You don't know if you guys remember Ted Haggard. He was one of the ones then. You can look him up. You'll see what happened to him. None of these so-called prophecies that I heard them speak ever came to fruition. Like, I don't know how many times I heard them say that in the next 10 years, and by the way, this was The kids were just little babies. They were all still in diapers. They said in the next 10 years, all of the wealth of the wicked is going to transfer to the righteous. And that's just been, they always just keep the new folks coming in. They keep them right on the edge of their seats. They keep promising a breakthrough. They keep promising all these things that are about to happen. And it just never quite gets there. But lo and behold, a new group of newbies come in and they get to, promote it, and they still get to rake in the money. I never saw one genuine miracle, not one severed arm grow back, no one got up out of a wheelchair, not one blind person received their sight, and many came forward to do so. And it was always this whole thing about just keep claiming it, just keep praying, just stay in faith, don't doubt, don't speak doubt, all this stuff. But isn't it interesting that the healings they claim at their meetings are all invisible? Babies raised from the dead inside the womb, you know, or lower back pain, or male pattern baldness, or post-nasal drip, or all of these things that you can't see. Where are the people with the, who lost an arm in the war and it just miraculously grows back? Where are all of those kinds of miracles, the kinds of things that we saw Jesus do? 
more recently, in the last three years, I was invited to, personally invited to a healing service in Dallas, where the guest speaker was a man by the name of David Hogan. He was also one of the ones who I followed around back then. I, I did it because it was my job. I didn't follow him around. I want to make that very clear. But uh, David Hogan talked for two hours. Not once did he even open a Bible. Not once did he even mention a scripture. He made bold claims about raising somewhere in the ballpark of 80-some people or something from the dead. Okay, He doesn't have any video footage or anything like that. He talked about healing countless people. He even said, and my kids were there, Krista was there, they can all attest this is all absolutely true. He said that he could command fish to bite his hook while fishing two at a time. All because he had the same authority over creation that Jesus had. And because I have a background in broadcast television and production, I was very certain, I was sure to pay attention to the setup of the room. And particularly the line of sight of the cameras for the big crowds. Their, their crowd, their large crowd, was worldwide and they were all watching online. Over to the far right by the wall, they directed all of the folks with cerebral palsy, everybody who were in wheelchairs, everybody who had visible maladies, uh, mental infirmities, visible physical issues. And those precious, desperate people were there to be healed and they were escorted over outside of the view of the cameras. And when the healing service began, I watched the ushers ever so subtly form a type of barrier between the so-called healers and those who were over to the far right. I can't tell you how angry this made me in that moment. I actually get emotional just thinking about it now. I saw a woman there with her son bawling because she couldn't get over to where they were. Is it too much to ask that if you can do all the things Jesus did, then please do it just like he did? Can you stop talking about it and just do it? Do it publicly in a crowd? Do it even in the face of the detractors? Even in the face of the people who are faithless? Jesus healed with a single word or touch. It was simple. It was easy. A lack of faith did not ever deter his power. There was uh, occasions in which it was not his preference to heal because of their lack of faith, but it wasn't that la lack of faith that somehow mystically squelched his divine authority. That is not what was going on. Jesus healed also instantly and completely in, in totality. There's not one occasion where the devil stole a healing in Scripture. Peter's mother-in-law she got up immediately and started cooking and fixing stuff and waiting on them, and that's what Scripture tells us. There was not one occasion in Scripture where Jesus told them to keep claiming their healing, that it might take some time, just speak it, and don't you dare speak any doubt. Not one time in Scripture do we see that. So why do we believe these things? Where did this stuff come from? Jesus also healed everyone. There were no controlled environments, no ushers creating barricades, no segmenting of the crowds according to what illnesses or infirmities they might have. It's important to know that Jesus practically eliminated sickness and disease from that region of Israel in his day, in that three and a half years. As he traveled around that whole region, he healed people day after day after day after day. And the only times he didn't heal everybody was when he did what we'll see in just a few moments here. But he healed organic disease and deformities that everybody knew. Everybody was aware that this person was dealing with this type of thing. Blindness from birth. Everyone knew this man had been blind his whole life. Everyone knew that this uh, person was crippled as long as they had known them. Everyone knew that this person over here had a withered, deformed hand. Even at the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter cuts off the soldier's ear, and Jesus reattaches it as if it had never been touched with a blade. And folks, Jesus raised the dead, as I mentioned before. And he did it because he's the light of life. He is the resurrection. He is the author of all life itself. He's the creator. And even death must submit to his authority. Hallelujah. Jesus was walking on the earth, God in the flesh, and as the creator, he performed creative miracles, and he also, let's not forget, he 
forgave sins. Jesus forgave sins. So I'm not being cynical. I'm just being biblical this morning. I'm begging of you to read your Bible and believe your Bible and don't go outside the parameters of your Bible. If these folks can do all the things Jesus did, their priority should be the same as his, right? They should have the same priorities. And his first priority was to prove it. He didn't talk about it. He did it over and over again. To those who claim they can, I say to you today, prove it. Can you imagine if you just take out that HD camera in your pocket that millions of people carry around today and point it at one of these miracles that you're telling me happen all the time in your ministry, upload it to YouTube, put it on the news. Where are all the videos? Where is all the evidence? Jesus had no problem doing this. If you could do all the things Jesus can do, where's the evidence? Where's the proof? I want to know where the people are that are walking on water or pulling wads of cash out of fish's mouth to, to buy clothing and food for the poor. I mean, if you can do all this stuff, I just don't understand. I, I, what I don't understand is why people can, over 35 years now, just in my lifetime and being aware of it, they've made these incredible claims, and I've not seen it one single time. And I'm not saying... I demand proof for my own self-gratification. I'm saying you claim it and you claim to represent God and the miracles were what validated a person of God. So if you're a person of God, then do what you say you can do. That's all I'm asking. But I'll tell you why we don't see it. Because their faith, if you get right down to the heart of the matter, their faith is focused on themselves and they have erroneous theology and they misrepresent God. And we don't see it because they are not God in the flesh, nor are they chosen men of God who has been given delegated authority to affirm them as he did his apostles. They were writing the word of God. Do you understand? Their message needed to be validated. And so he validated them by miracle signs and wonders to prove that the things they were saying, their writings and their message were the very words of God. They were not from the inspiration of men. They were God's words. That's why we hold God's word in our hand today. And that's why Jesus gave that authority to his disciples. They were inspired of the Spirit to write Holy Scripture. And that needed to be validated the same way that Jesus validated himself as the Son of God. So our focus today should not be asking God to prove himself over and over in supernatural ways because you have all the proof you need when you hold God's word in your hand. You either believe that or you don't. I, listen, this is the truth. God should not have to do one more thing, not one more single thing. You should believe what that word of God says, no matter what, with not, without one additional shred of proof. I'm going to make this case in just a moment. He's already said it. He's already done it. And in the faith, we're supposed to believe it. And that was Jesus' priority. Look at verse 32. Now when evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and all those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door, and he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. The demons knew who he was. As I mentioned, they were terrified, but the people only seemed interested in the miracles. They wanted their healing, and it... And uh, that first night, all the people clamored after he cast out the demon and after word got around that he heal healed Peter's mother-in-law, uh, they clamored to find every sick person they knew in the area, and they brought them to the door of the house where Jesus was, which, by the way, um, again, if these modern faith healers were doing what Jesus was doing, they would not be able to turn people, they would not be able to keep people away. There would be people constantly at the doors of their churches or their homes. That's the way uh, the, the human condition works. When someone's got what you need, you're going to go to them. And that's what they did with Jesus. And if anybody out there was performing genuine miracles the way Jesus was, they could not keep people away. That's another evidence. They would be inundated with crowds of people. And I don't mean to be ugly this morning. And I'm not trying to be a jerk. I, I really am not. But this is something I, that I do, quite honestly, I'll tell you, it, it, it upsets me. And I, I, don't believe it's in a, I don't believe it's in a fleshly sort of anger. I, I believe it's a righteous 
anger in that they are, they are saying things about God that are not true. And in the process, they are hurting millions of people. And I've seen it over and over again. And it, it breaks my heart. And I want to just point out today how easily our motives can get off track in all of this stuff. How easily we can start wanting the temporal pleasures and the temporal things instead of keeping our focus on the eternal and spiritual promises that Christ has offered us. And I don't blame any of these folks for wanting to be healed. If it were my wife or my children, I would go and I would want them healed as well. Would you not? You would pray for healing. And we should pray for healing. We should pray for healing when we have need of healing. But we need to get Scripture straight. We need to do what we read here was the entire purpose of Christ's coming. It was not to heal. Christ's purpose was to preach the gospel. Look at verse 35. And in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus rose up, went out of the house, and went away to a desolate place, and was praying there. And Simon and his companions searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. So they were wanting more, more miracles, more healing. Did he say, well, let's go back to the crowd so that I might heal everyone there, for I was sent for this purpose. That's not what Jesus said. Look what he says in verse 38. And he said to them, let us go elsewhere to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came out for. In Luke 4.43, in his account, Jesus says, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for, this, for I was sent for this purpose. That was his purpose. His purpose was not to come and perform miracles. His purpose was to preach the gospel. And on this morning, in essence, he ditched the crowds who were seeking healing in order to go preach the gospel. Verse 39, And he went preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out the demons. And his miracles, folks, were a badge of authority to affirm he was God in the flesh. And the words he spoke, his gospel message, were the very words of God. And these words are the power that can pull a sinner from the kingdom of, of darkness, as I mentioned before, and place them in the kingdom of light. And this is first and foremost the eternal gospel. It's an eternal promise. It will change a person's destination for eternity. You can heal them. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. You know what the bummer thing is? He had to die again. <laughs> he had to die twice. Have you ever thought about that? The miracles are not the point. The message is the point. Scour the New Testament. Get into the book of Acts, into the epistles. You find that Paul has an issue with his eyes. That's my Bill Johnson uh, impersonation. Uh, he stands up and he says, uh, someone, he's doing the word of knowledge thing. He says, someone out here, someone uh, has a problem with their eyes. <laughs> Took you a second, but I think you figured it out. They, they say never trust a faith healer who wears glasses, right? Scripture says Trophimus was left sick by Paul in the town of Miletus. Paul mentions that Timothy has frequent ailments. Epaphroditus is ill in Scripture. There's not one mention of healing or instructions on how to conduct healing services within the church or in the final pastoral epistles. First and Second Timothy and Titus, there's no mention of someone having a healing ministry. In addition, there's not a guarantee of healing for believers in this temporal world. What's promised to believers is death. And if you're in Christ, your promise is that one day this broken down, messed up body is going to be glorified. That in a moment, we're going to be changed. Okay? This explosion of supernatural healing in Jesus' day was not to prove that God is compassionate or that God is loving or that God is good or for the purpose of even providing health. It was to affirm that he was, in fact, the true Messiah, and it was, in fact, the true gospel. In order to display his cosmic power over every disease, over demons, to show his authority over the physical and the spiritual world, to affirm that he had the power to conquer sin and Satan, and to rescue sinners' souls. And that is the ultimate promise. By his own resurrection, he showed that he had the power to be raised up in a glorified body, the first fruits of the resurrection, and one day you and I will be fitted for a perfect, eternal body. Amen. Hallelujah. We aren't denying miracles. Now, I'm not a, a miracle denier. 
I believe that God has done everything he's ever said he's done in the word of God. And I believe that if God wants to, he will do it. If it's his will, he will do it. But we do not demand God to do what we say. There's no such thing in Scripture. Listen, there's no such thing in Scripture as a declarative prayer where you declare things and tell God or, or command God to do things for you. You can't find it. All we see in Scripture are petitionary prayers. These are prayers of supplication. These are prayers of you being poured out in humility before God. And even Jesus, God in the flesh, prayed, Thy will be done. He submitted to His Father's will. We do not demand God to do what we say. We pray humbly in faith, and ultimately, as I said, we trust Him with the outcome. And I'm going to close with a quote from Abraham to the rich man in the, the parable, this, uh, he's in suffering torment in this place called Hades, the grave. And he begged Abraham to allow Lazarus to rise from the dead so that Lazarus could go to his five brothers and warn them of this place of torment. Surely, he's thinking, if they see the miracle of Lazarus raised, if he warns them, surely they will repent and believe. And Abraham's response should be how we respond to those seeking signs as well. He points to the written word. Look what he says. This is, man, this is the smoking gun. This is the death nail right here. Luke 16, 29 through 31. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. And listen, when this was written, that was the Bible. The law and the prophets was the Bible. Jesus is saying they have the Bible. They have the Old Testament. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Surely that kind of miracle, if they see him raised from the dead, knowing who he was, and he went back and warned them, surely they would repent. But Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, if they do not listen to the Bible, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. You see, our focus must be to point to the miracle of God's word, what God has done, what it, he will be faithful to do. He has never broken a promises. And all of those promises lie in waiting for you and I if we will only put our faith and trust in him. If we will put our faith in him and his finished work. When he came here, the son of God, his redemptive work, laid down his life, took on the wrath of his own father for you and I, for your sin, paid the penalty. If you will just repent of your sin and believe in his work, then you will become a follower of Christ, a genuine follower of Christ. What is written in God's word is essential. What is written in God's word are the eternal words of life. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And Lord, we do not have hearts of stone. We're compassionate. We love our brothers and sisters. We love our families. We love the people in our lives, Lord, who are facing illness and sickness and disease. And Lord, we do lift them up to you. We do pray for their healing. We do pray that if, you're, if it's your will, Lord, that you would touch their, their body, you would touch their situation, you would heal them according to your own will, Lord, and not our own. Lord, I pray that the folks in this local church would understand the importance of of the eternal words of life, your word. And that holding to the word of God is all the revelation that they need. It's all the miracles that they need. They just simply need to believe it. And Lord, I just pray that if there's someone in this room today or someone watching online or someone listening to the podcast, if they have never come to the place where they've seen their own depravity, their own fallenness, they felt what it means to be spiritually poor. They know that they cannot change their situation in and of themselves, that their own righteousness is filthy rags, that they would cry out to you and repent and believe in you and your finished work and that you would take them from the kingdom of darkness and place their feet firmly in the kingdom of the light. That is our prayer today, Lord. We know that your spirit is able and we know it's all up to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thanks again for joining us. If you'd like to visit us in person, we meet at 1015 every Sunday morning at the Glenpool Conference Center. You are always welcome.